I'll share my screen, not mute myself. All right, can everybody see four tools to support instruction in any modality? I see lots of thumbs up, so we must have done something right. Thank you. All right, so again, welcome. Uh, we appreciate you being here. My name is Daniel Jordan, and I'm with the Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence. And uh, today we're going to demonstrate four tools that can support your instruction in any modality. So that's whether you're teaching on ground, online, or if you're one of those who have chosen to join us on the uh, hybrid adventure, it works there as well. All right, so one of the most powerful ways to engage students is to let them take charge of their own learning. That's a quote from an author named Eric Jensen, and I wish I could give you the name of the book that that was in, but it is slipping my mind. But the whole point behind that is to remind you that when you're integrating any kind of a tool or strategy or whatever it is in your class, there's gotta be a purpose behind it. And the best purpose behind an ed tech tool is to put ownership of the learning in the hands of the student. So when you're integrating these tools, whether it's Padlet, Flipgrid, the annotation tools, or feedback in D2L, with the exception of the video feedback in D2L, because that's more instructor-centric, the other three really give you the power to give students the ability to take that control. We're going to demonstrate how that can happen. The first tool I want to talk about today is Padlet. So it's something hopefully you're a little bit familiar with but it's a tool that is somewhere between a document and a full-fledged website builder. Uh, Padlet empowers everybody to make content the way that they want, whether it's a quick bulletin board, a blog, or you could even have students create a portfolio of their work. Uh, some of the strengths of Padlet include the fact that it's easy and intuitive. It's very simple to use. There's not a lot of uh, moving parts with Padlet. There can be a lot of moving parts with Padlet, but when it comes to creating one or using one, there are not a lot of moving parts. It's very easy to do. Uh, it's highly collaborative. Um, obviously, you would create this with the purpose of either sharing it or having folks come together and uh, discuss or curate ideas over some kind of a topic. Uh, you can upload multiple file types. You can upload an image. You can put add a document. You can add a video, a, a GIF or a GIF, however you choose to pronounce that <laughs> file type. And it's useful in all modalities. Although it does have some strengths, there are some weaknesses. Uh, the free version of Padlet only gives you three boards to use. So cost can be a little bit prohibitive there. Uh, I know in the past we've done the tech mini grants and I believe we're hoping to do something similar to that again. But uh, it, the cost is not too high, but it can be prohibitive if you're not looking to spend any money on a tool for your course. And then the popularity. I know we've talked about Padlet quite a bit over the last few years, and uh, a lot of people have adopted it. So you need to be cautious or at least aware of where students may be using it. And again, have a purpose, have a plan, and then be clear and concise with your instructions for those things, because using it kind of haphazardly, if, if there are a lot of folks using it, students may lose interest just because of the fact that they've seen it in a number of different courses. So how would you use Padlet? Here are some of the ideas that I've come up with and I'm gonna ask you for yours as well. So in just a moment, but uh, you could use it again as the digital bulletin board. So you could place news items, you could put ideas or topics for students to comment about underneath. Uh, you could use it as a virtual parking lot or a ticket out the door. So you pose a few questions and students have to respond with a, a response on the Padlet. You could use it for collaborative note-taking. So students could add their notes to the Padlet as you're presenting or as their peers are presenting. And then at the end, everyone has access to those notes. Uh, you could use it as a discussion board alternative. Your Padlet could have a prompt that students need to respond to at the top. And they respond by video, by audio, by posting an image, you know, what have you. They've got, again, the power to decide how they respond. And uh, you could choose to do that rather than through the, the traditional discussion board where it's text-based and D2L does have some audio and video options, but this is a little more tightly packaged. So does anyone have any other ideas or any other use cases, some examples of how you've seen it done or how you would like to do it? Feel free to unmute and share with the group. I use it as, a, as an introduction at the beginning of the course. And, uh, and I allow the students to use memes and videos and things that are exciting things to demonstrate like how they feel about the course or starting the course, things like that. 
Uh, but it, but it is on the wall, like you explained, like it's on this type of wall, but then they have the opportunity to use additional things like, you know, videos and memes instead of just writing something out. Exactly. I was going to say, I've got an example of one that I used for introductions in a SLU 101 course I taught a few years ago. And uh, one thing I would do differently here. So you see, it's very text heavy. There's only a few images and one of those is of me and my family. Uh, if I were to do this again, I would ask students to post an image that either is of themselves or something that they feel represents themselves, just so you kind of have that visual and they have visuals of each other. And um, yeah, I, I think I would take advantage of the fact that they can use those visual elements more than just the text here. But yeah, I love the idea of using it as virtual introductions. Plus it gives you something to go back on. So if you're gonna have a meeting with a student, you can pull your pad, paddle it up or, if you, you, know, you choose to use the free version, you can take images of these or save them, download them, and then you can wipe it clean. But you could always have that as a reference piece. So if you're going to meet with a student, just kind of refresh yourself with you know, who they are, kind of a little bit of their background. If, if you get into some of that in these questions and uh, can give you some ideas or, or common ground for discussions, especially if you're going to have to have a difficult discussion with a student, it can be helpful to refresh yourself on who they are, where they're coming from. And uh, again, it just depends on how deeply you probe with those prompts at the beginning. Daniel, um, I use them uh, for uh, reading assignments that are due. So they might have an article or two to read for class the next day, and I'll have them uh, post three takeaways from the article, but they can't post three takeaways that anybody else posted, or they could post two salient quotes and then at the beginning of the next class, I would pull that Padlet up and we would look at those posts. And so without me having to teach the article, they've already read the other ones because they couldn't post something someone else had posted. Um, they've read the article because they had to have something to say on their posting. And most importantly, we start the class with a discussion about their takeaways so it's a much more fluid way of discussing the readings instead of me just standing up there telling them what they should have gotten out of the reading or asking them to say what they got out of the reading. It's right there on the board. Another way of doing that is to have them post a picture that represents a key concept from the reading. And then they have to explain that. And so each person would, you know, I'd say, Mary, why did you pick that picture? Tell us what that means, you know, what, what, how that represents the reading or something. So the images, you know, can be really powerful. And sometimes I just give them the option of one or the other, and then you have a nice combination of things. But I found it to be a really great way to make sure that they're reading without having to quiz them. Um, mm -hmm. And it gets some really good conversation going on. Yeah, Absolutely. it's a resource for them too when you do it that way, Candace, because you you provide either the link or you give them the image of what you did and then you say here it is put it in your resource or your toolbox or whatever and this is something to keep referring back to for review of the material mm -hmm. yeah and, and that's similarly turn into collaborative note taking sorry christine go ahead oh no 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 it's okay just adding on to to both of those um discussions i i use padlet as well as more of like a a stop and jot or a quick write or a formative assessment um, and, and, you know, what Candace was saying about, you know, deleting the boards that that's been so helpful. I just, I take a screenshot and just save them. Sometimes I'll show those boards to students before we in, enter into the Padlet, you know, especially my block ones who aren't really proficient with Padlet or utilizing that amazing space that they have to import, like, like um, Georgina was saying, the videos, the images, the gifts, the, I mean, there's just so many ways that they can make sense and make meaning of the content through those digital images. I, I feel like that's a strength of the Padlet. So um, yeah, it's a very useful tool. I enjoy it so very much. I bet the students enjoy it too, because it allows them to show a little bit of personality and creativity in ways that the traditional discussion board or, you know, response to a prompt on reading. It, there's, like you said, so much more you can do with it that you just don't get in other places. So I had, it has, I, Oh, go ahead, Georgina. No, I was just going to add that I used, um, I even used Padlet um, off and in my conference presentations, like I just did one a couple of weeks ago and people are like, how'd you do that? And I, you know, and I try to emphasize how they can use the Padlet 
for their student. Like, for example, I was in a, uh, a conference for English learners and, you know, talking about how a Padlet, even though they may be too shy to say anything in the classroom, a Padlet gives you the opportunity to engage all students because everyone has to post. And then you give the students who can't write it the opportunity to do pictures and things like that. So I go through the motions during the con the present the content of my presentation, also demonstrating, you know, the use of, of Padlet and how it could contribute to the success of kids in classroom. Well, it also has a nice social element as well, where students can respond to each other's posts. Can you go back to yours, Daniel, for a sec? Sure can. Um, they can just, you know, uh, like it, you know, um, you can see there, there are some hearts. Um, so you can like somebody's post, which, you know, students thrive on that. It gives them that little dose of endorphins or whatever. Um, but it, you can also require them to respond to each other. You can say, you've got to respond to one other person or you've got to interact with somebody else. And, um, you know, um, so it, it, there's a nice interactive element going on there outside of what you could do at the beginning of a class where you're discussing their posts. It gets them kind of primed for the conversation. Uh, and if you have your students create the free account and sign in, their responses will not say anonymous. So that would be one other thing I would change because on the responses, nobody had any idea who was responding unless they did like Sarah did here and add their name at the end. So having them just create that free account really quick, they can use their St. Leo email address. And uh, then when they reply, they reply with their name and not anonymously. So. I didn't know that part, Daniel. Thank you. I because that's always no, the, I I, the hard work. I started looking at their responses, and this was a couple of years ago, and I was like, uh, nobody has any idea who you are when you reply. So we need to fix that. <laughs> that is so great to know. <laughs> yeah. So if you if you need to tell them either, you know, add your name to your response or create the free account so we know who you are when you reply, because that keeps everyone sane. <laughs> All right, so the next tool I want to talk about, and I apologize that these are so kind of, you know, we're running through these quickly, but uh, in the interest of time, I want to talk about Flipgrid. So Flipgrid is another tool. It's actually integrated in part of our Microsoft Office 365 package. It's a Microsoft tool. Microsoft actually purchased it. And it allows you to invite students to interact using video responses in an online discussion space. So again, some strengths would be that it's very easy to use uh, and, a lot of students have experience with it coming from high school. Uh, it's highly collaborative. Again, it's useful in all modalities. And one of the best parts is it's free. So there are no limitations regarding cost because it's already part of a package of tools we have at our disposal. Some of the weaknesses, uh, you know, the video only thing may be a little bit of a weakness. There's no file posting or any of that stuff. It's just a video response to discussion board. So it is kind of limited in what you can do in comparison to the power that Padlet has. Um, it's popularity, again, uh, it's fairly common. I know we've talked about it at, at length in a lot of our uh, presentations. And not to say that that's a bad thing. I mean, it's popular because it works. But just, again, consider the fact that a lot of people are using it. So have a purpose and have clear and concise instructions so your students know what's expected, that, what is expected of them. And they don't just kind of default to what everyone else does. And then we're also still working on an integration with D2L. Unfortunately, right now it works seamlessly with things like Canvas and Google Classroom. D2L gets a little tricky when it comes to integrating, but there are some ways to work around that. Daniel, um, I, I haven't used Flipgrid yet because I, I personally find it a little bit complicated. Maybe it's just I haven't played with it enough, but I wanted to ask... Um, what is the difference between using Flipgrid and then just using the audio video chat function in the discussion box? Is there is there like a major difference or something that's you know more quality with Flipgrid than what I get from using the discussion forum um, chat feature? I mean, the uh, video feature? Daniel, how about I show them a grid and they'll get a better feel for what it is? Would that be that okay? That would be great. Let me right. allow you here so you can see that. And I was just going to say, uh, I've, I've never actually used Flipgrid in any of my courses. I've used the video functions in D2L just because they were right there. I think Flipgrid's a little nicer just because it's more aesthetically pleasing, but that's just me. 
Um, but Candace has used it quite a bit, and I know we use it in the teaching at St. Leo course as well. So I'll let the, uh, the experts demonstrate. How they so do I it. think you're, look, you're looking at a grid from one of my classes. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. So, um, and you can just send them the link. It doesn't have to be integrated into D2L. You can send them the link to the grid once you've created it. When Microsoft bought out Flipgrid, I was so excited because it's totally free. Everything is free. And actually, Daniel, I think they have changed it. I'm not positive. I think you can upload documents now if you want students to say, look at a document and respond to it or something. But I'm not positive about that. So I use it for class introductions, even in on-ground classes, you can use it as class introductions. So I'm gonna take you to the first one. So they go to introductions and, there's a, you know, I can give a description of what they need to do. I can upload a picture if I want. Um, and Flipgrid even provides you some, uh, some stock pictures. And then I always start by introducing myself. Hello, and welcome this? to EDU 645. Okay, so I just say a I've been bit looking about forward myself. to you joining our class. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and you can set the time. So this is a, a 90 second uh, maximum. So it's not too painful. <laughs> um, you can also create a post-it note that you can stick right above your screen so that the key points that you want to talk about are right there. So you're looking at your screen when you're talking about those post-it notes. It makes it so easy for them. And I really encourage them to use it because it goes more smoothly. And then here's the really cool thing. Um, everybody, I, and I have them respond to at least two people in the class. So for instance, Mo introduces herself. Hi, everybody. My name is Monique Henry. I go by Mo. Every All right. And she tell, and I usually say, you know, tell three things about yourself, maybe something professional, a hobby you like, why you're taking this course, whatever, you know, I give them something to go on so they know what to talk about or have, you know, it makes it a little bit easier, but then they respond to each other. Hi, Monique. I wanted to say, first of all, that I absolutely love your nails. I only saw a glimpse of them, but they look very bright and fun. Okay, so we have a little frivolous stuff going on here. Kind of fun. Um, but anyway, so the introductions are just an easy way to ease into your Flipgrid. But then I also use them for peer feedback groups. So I teach a course called uh, Reading and Writing Integration, and they, um, these are people who are learning how to teach writing. And so if they're gonna learn how to teach their students how to write, they need to experience that also. So they do some brief writing clips and then they experience the peer feedback. And so I put them in groups of you know, three to five and then they read a short clip of their writing and then they have to provide each other feedback on that. So let's see Mo again. The important thing about fiction is that it is not real. Okay, so she's reading a piece that she's written. It's kind of a poem about the uh, characteristics of fiction. And then here you can hear feedback from other peers. Oh my goodness, Monique. I absolutely loved your poem. In fact, I'm going to actually not plagiarize it, but copy it and read that to my class when we are studying plot. It was phenomenal. I loved your use of figurative language. Um, especially, I mean, you start right off in that first stanza with explaining fiction by using those um, similes and so you can see here you know the feedback is rich now I have I give them criteria for the feedback they have to you know pick out two things they really liked about the piece make one suggestion about the piece of writing and one uh, question that they have something they wanted to know more about that maybe the writer didn't address so I, I definitely don't just turn them loose and say go talk um, you know I give them some really concrete things they have to accomplish um, and you can set the time, as I said before, you can set this for 90 seconds, you can set it for two minutes. They can actually, if they go over the two minutes, I say, don't stress over it. I just want you to try to be succinct. But if you need a little more time, just post a second video and say part two. Um, so there's, you know, it, it, I try to kind of lower the affective filter and not make it too big. Um, but as long as they've met the criteria, then they've met that, uh, you know, that assignment for the week. But I used to have students give their peer feedback in D2L and they would um, do it all in writing, all in text. Um, and when I switched to Flipgrid, I asked them, I said, would you prefer this in writing? Is this too much trouble? Is it whatever, you know? Absolutely, every time I ask, it is unanimous. They love this real people feedback. They, they love the intonations and the voice inflections and the passion and the caring. and 
And I've really seen the students step up and support each other in ways you wouldn't see in writing. And um, so it really builds community. Um, you know, in terms of building community, uh, you know, when I, a lot of times I'll get the students in this class halfway through the program and it's the first time they've actually seen each other. Now, of course, now we have Zoom and everybody sees everything, but well, not everything, but they see each other. Um, but um, they were like, wow, I, this is the first time I've really felt like I've gotten to know you because I've seen you, I've heard your voice. And so there's something about building community in this and it, it's short and sweet and um I just, I couldn't say enough good things about it. Um, and it's really not that hard once you jump in and you, you know, play around with it a little bit. And we're happy to help you with that. Um, so if, if you want to explore Flipgrid a bit, um, you know, I'd encourage you to go to it first and try to set up your account. Be sure, this is important, that you set it up through your St. Leo account. They'll ask you for your domain because you want students to all come in through that. First of all, it's private that way. When they go in that way, it's not, these grids aren't available to everybody in the universe. It's just if they have, they come from that domain. Um, and it's also much easier for them to connect up um, because all they have to do is go to the single sign on and it brings them right into Flipgrid. So, um, you know, be sure you opt for the option of, um, you know, using the same domain. But, oh, here's another trick. Their domain or their email, uh, when it asks you what domains will you permit to have access, theirs is at email.stleo.edu and yours is at stleo.edu. So you have to plug in both of those to make sure that everybody has access because your access will be a little bit different than theirs because theirs is at email.stleo.edu. So that's all I got. Dr. Roberts. Yeah. Um, hey, this is Vicki. Um, I just went, well, as you were speaking, I went on to my St. Leo email and went under the all apps and the Microsoft Office thing, mm -hmm. but I don't see the app for Flipgrid there. Shouldn't there be an app there? That's a really good question. Uh, it, it seems to me like there should be. Maybe that's something we could ask, uh, do it. But um, uh, you, you, I created my account right there on the Flipgrid page. I just Googled Flipgrid and went to it, but I created it using my St. Leo email. You can use your Gmail, but you're not gonna wanna do that if you wanna keep your students in your right. class and you want them all to use their St. Leo email. So, um, so just you know, create it using that email account. But you know, that's something we could definitely look into and see if uh, do it, you know, can, if there is an app app per se that they could add to the 365 menu. Great, thanks. I have a quick question. This is Danae Williamson um, and my apologies for getting on here a little bit late. Um, I were, those of you that have utilized some of these other um, Padlet, Flipgrid and the other thing we're gonna look at today, do any of your students struggle with going back and forth? I mean, I try to do everything in D2L so that it doesn't come back and haunt me, to be honest with you. Um, does anyone struggle with the students going, why I didn't know where to go? I, I know these are master students. I always post the link in my D2L module that I'm where I'm going to use it so that they know that it's an assignment. I also put the assignment in the grade book and I do grade it. Uh, so they know they're gonna get points for it, but there's no reason they can't see the link and tr navigate to that link. Um, so I remind them, put, pardon me. So you can just put the link in that week's module. Yes, yeah, um, the, yeah. Okay. That's, how, that's how I do it. And then, and you can also, of course, put it in the announcements, you know, don't forget, go to your Flipgrid. But I also use it in my on ground classes. Um, I, I, I had a, a teaching diverse populations uh, course once where we uh, actually um, had a Flipgrid going on with a, a class of students who were going to go to college in the United States, but they were going to a school in Greece. And so they were Greek students learning English. But I wanted my students to have a flavor of what uh, uh, other people experience as English language learners and what it, that experience is of uh, coming to another country and that sort of thing. And oh my gosh, the interactions between these two classes were amazing. My class met on ground every day, but the, fl the Flipgrid was, was, was awesome. And it's also a great way, again, to get them engaged in reading. So you may say, you know, read this article and post two things in Flipgrid that you found out. 
And um, so that's a, an at-home assignment to get them to do the reading. They come to class uh, more ready to discuss. So, you know, it's certainly not just for online, but I have found it to be a wonderful way to create community online. And, um, and, I, and the student reviews of using it are outstanding. They, they really like it a lot. And I thought that they might find it cumbersome or they wouldn't want to be on video. Oh, and by the way, they don't have to be on video. If you have a student who has a religious reason for not being on video or, or, or whatever, um, they, can, they can post an emoji, they can post a, a picture. Uh, Flipgrid has given more options now for that. So it, you know, the video should not be a, a, you know, a deterrent or a problem for students who you know, are uncomfortable with it. But uh, I've never really had a student in that situation. I'm sure that there are students who would prefer that, but by and large, they really like interacting with each other and, and really supporting each other. Well, one thing yes. you can try doing, Danae or anybody else who's trying to just post the link in your course, you can always set conditions on those elements in the course so you can require them to have at least access the link. I mean, it can't, D2L can't do anything yeah. compulsory. Yeah. On, but you can set those conditions when you create that element in an online or hybrid, hybrid class, or if you're using your course shell in your on-ground course, you can set that so they have to click that before they can move on to whatever is next. It's also, oh, a a terrific, it's, it's also a terrific way to do a guest speaker. So let's say you have yeah. a speaker that can't come to your 11 o'clock class. Um, but they could post a video about their topic, whether that's on, you know, uh, the human genome or, uh, you know, research in, in viruses or, you know, uh, you know, somebody in political science or whatever. They can post a video and then your students can respond to that or ask them questions and then they could go back in and answer those questions and seeing that interaction between these content area experts is fascinating. Um, I, I've been engaged in a couple with, um, with authors of, uh, of uh, you know, really popular texts um, and uh, with, with someone who was a specialist in cognitive science and um, they, they had a weekly posting and then the students would respond to it. So it's, a, it's really a great way to get uh, content area experts engaged in your class in times that work for them. Absolutely. Or before we move on, just in regards to um, Vicki's question, if you do go to the Microsoft 365, um, the waffle, um, if you don't see it in the waffle, you just would need to select all apps and you'll see the, um, the widget or the, the app in the, in the 365 option. Awesome. I, found, I also wanted to say to Vicki, I found that when I use the QR code, it's... Um, it's so much easier for the students to, to log in. They just point their camera at the screen. And then once I have everybody in the Padlet, I then switch over my screen share to the actual Padlet where the information is being posted and they can see it at the same time on the screen. Um, what they see on their phone, they're seeing it also on the screen. So that helps a little bit too. Speaking okay. of the QR code, you'll see on this list of ideas for how to use it, the Flipgrid AR. So I was trying to think of ways you could use this in an on-ground class and came up with the idea. So if you're doing some kind of a, a lab or even if it's just you're using rotations for the day, uh, using QR codes to post video instructions that were either created by you or your students for whatever's happening at that station would be a great way to give them. Uh, it's better than, well, it's an alternative to just a handout with written instructions. You can give a video with a demonstration or you know, whatever other information you want to include. Another thing you could do with it is have a gallery walk where students create presentations on whatever they've created, whether it's a, you know, a poster or whatever it is that they're going to leave there, but a QR code again, recording with a recording of them presenting whatever it is, but they don't have to actually be there to do it. So you, they could actually be free to rotate around the class as well. Just some alternative ideas to using this, but it's, augmented reality, the QR code pops up and then their little Flipgrid video is right there in space and you just watch it from there. Any other Flipgrid ideas, comments before we move on? There is one option that um, I've used this semester because I've been using it in my hybrid class and um, you can post like a YouTube video built right into there. 
Um, so as part of my asynchronous piece of my hybrid course, I'll have them do an activity, some worksheet or something, and then, or watch the video, and then they actually have to give feedback in it. And so that video is directly embedded into the side of the Flipgrid. So when you give them the link, um, they'll watch the video. And that's part of the instructions is you say, watch the video and give me three things you learned about the video or whatever. Um, so that's an option for Flipgrid as well. Here's another cool thing about it. When you create a grid, let's say you've, you know, you've created one for a class and there's, you know, three or four different topics or whatever, you can just replicate that same grid for the next class. So you can, it, it'll erase all of the videos, but the grid itself, once it's created, you can reuse it and then adjust it if you need to anytime. So it's really easy to reuse from semester to semester, but it'll save all of your earlier ones. Absolutely. Thanks, Greg. That's a great idea. All right. So the annotation tool in Zoom, I would suspect we're all relatively familiar with that. Uh, I know we've used those in a few of our presentations and uh, I've seen them used in some faculty development day presentations as well. But it just allows you to add annotations on your screen during video calls. It's a great tool for remote teams or classes to easily brainstorm and collaborate. So some strengths, again, it's really easy to use. Uh, it's pretty easy to find, uh, highly collaborative. It's great in all modalities. You can even break this out in a, you know, an on-ground course and have students uh, give their feedback without having to get up, move around, do anything extra. And again, no cost because the university is already taking care of that. Some weaknesses, um, the annotations can get chaotic if you don't have, again, specific, clear, concise instructions for what you want people to do. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're going to have those annotations, uh, understand that things can get stacked on top of each other. It can be, like I said, chaotic. I don't know any other way to describe it other than it gets a little messy. Uh, remembering to clear the annotations when you change the slide is also important because if you're going to change the slide, those annotations remain until you clear them. And then managing attributions. I find that to be a little tricky sometimes. So if you want to do something that's really low stakes and it doesn't matter, who's uh, placing their annotations where, you might wanna turn those attributions off so it doesn't give the name of the person who placed it there. Or I'm sorry, if you're doing something high stakes, if you're doing something low stakes and it doesn't matter and people are just gonna put it, you might wanna turn them on. Or there may be a reason you have for having them on or off. It, it's not exactly in the easiest place to find to turn those on and off, but it is important to make sure you've got them configured the way you want before you turn everybody loose. So using annotation tools allows your presentations to be more interactive. So whether it's you or your students, uh, anyone can utilize those. It allows the audience and the presenter to give feedback. Uh, it's great for formative assessments, just a quick, hey, did you understand this? Did you not understand this? There are a bunch of different ways you can utilize these things. Uh, you might even use them during office hours to pull up a student's work and uh, annotate over their work to demonstrate where they had some success, where they need to add a little uh, more content, whatever it is, you can use that. It's not just for presenting, you know, to large groups. It's, it can be one-on-one -on -one as well. Does anybody else have any other ideas for using the annotation tools? Have you used them before? Do you like them? Do you hate them? What are your thoughts? I've used them, Daniel. I, I do, when you said it can get a bit chaotic, I'd like to just share that there is a text typing tool rather than the... Um, Yes. actual freehand script tool, um, which can get, um, you know, yes, like you said, a little messy, like spaghetti on the screen. Very much um, so. but, but the students really do enjoy it. You just have to be sure that um, you clear it out before you progress to your next slides. Um, otherwise, it'll stay and you have to, you know, let the class know that we're done annotating. <laughs> so it, they don't keep marking up your slides, but, but I think it's a great tool. It, it just provides that bit of, like you said, active engagement when you need to kind of stop and make sure students are engaged in the content. Absolutely. So I've got an example here of a little bit of what not to do because I'm just really kind of turning you loose. I just want everybody to be comfortable with finding how to access the tools. So you find the annotation tool if you're not familiar with it by hovering your mouse at the top center of the screen and then selecting view options. And then you select annotation tools. And then you see there's a, an entire 
tray of options for you to use. So like Christine said, it, it can get messy, but you could also use the text tool and type things out like our friend down here who wrote hello, but it's not limited to just participants. So you as the presenter can highlight circle, star, stamp, check, underline, whatever the annotation tools are, you've got access to that full suite as well. One of the great parts about the annotation tool for each screen is if you want to capture what your students have done, you can just go up to the top and hit the save button and then it saves an image of it automatically. And then you could share it out with a class as well. And the same thing can happen in breakout rooms. So you could actually have your students work on something in a breakout room, have one person save it and then share it out with the rest of the class when you come back together um and do that but it is it takes a little bit of getting used to as a, if you're going to do it multiple slides over to be able to go in and save it clear it and then start over refreshed because you can see how everything just kind of lays over top of the next slide <laughs> which can be kind of a pain but once you get the hang of it um, and practice with it then it's definitely can be an effective tool absolutely It'd be great if this thing would let me go back. We're really enjoying this guy not talking to us. Maybe. It's gone rogue. There we go. So yeah, does anybody have any questions or comments or anything else about the annotation tools? While I'm wrestling with this presentation. Awesome. So the last thing we're going to share here, and I'm going to stop this while I'm messing with it and Greg is going to demonstrate the uh, video feedback tools in D2L. And I had some things to say about it, but I can't get the presentation to work with me right now. So we're just going to turn it over to Craig's demonstration. And we'll come back for the rest in just a minute. All right, perfect. Let me go ahead and make sure. Can you all see my screen right now, D2L? I'm hoping and praying that everything works well and I don't have bandwidth issues um, when this thing first started. <laughs> I, you know, but anyway, so hopefully everything loads correctly. So I'm going to go through really three different things that you can do with it, starting with the basic um, video feedback and then kind of take it up a notch and use this outside tool to be able to do a little bit more with your video feedback. Um, giving them annotations. And then another one that's actually going to flip over to Flipgrid um, and show you how to give private feedback um, in the Flipgrid for students as well. So all of these are video feedback related um, to student work. So you can see here some students have turned in some work. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the first one uh, or this one here. And I'll go ahead and pull this one up. And I would be able to see the assignment here. And so um, once the assignment would be pulled up, um, if I wanna just give regular feedback, obviously I can do that here if it's a rubric, but down below is where I have an option for audio and video feedback. If you don't wanna have your face up there on a video, then you can just do audio feedback if you want to. But we're, for the demonstration purposes, we're gonna use video recording. We'll pull this up. And it gives you up to 30 minutes. I don't think any of us are going to do 30 minute feedback for one student. You know, if you had 20 students and you multiply that by 30 minutes, well, that'd be a whole lot of hours of spending time giving your feedback. Um, but anyway, so you know, what happened to my, well, let's try this again. I'm going to click. What happened here? Maybe it won't let you do it because we're all on Zoom. Yeah, I wonder if I need to, let me turn off my 
I'm thinking my camera is the problem. It's pretty self-explanatory. I think we all, I mean, I appreciate you showing us the video, but it was pretty, it's pretty easy. Yeah, I can show you an example of what it looks like. So let me show you. I have a an imposter student um, pulled up over here. And so when the students go to read your feedback, obviously they go to the assignments area. Um, and this is what it would look like for the students. And so if you had any kind of feedback in here, this is what you would see. And so the students could all just have to put up or pull up read here. And once they click read, um, and this is what you may want, depending on how you do feedback, this might be a good way to um, show the students in the beginning of the semester, like, here's exactly how I'm going to give feedback. Here's where you need to find your feedback. Because I find that even, you know, every semester, the students don't necessarily read the feedback and not because they don't want to, it's because they don't necessarily know when it comes in and where to find it. And so explaining that to the students right from the get go. Um, so they know, like every time I'm going to, you know, grade your assignment, I'm going to give you some sort of feedback, whether it's through the rubric, whether it's through text or whether it's through video, I'm going to do some sort of feedback and this is where you're going to find it. And so once they know that, then every single time, um, they can have that. And if they go to their notifications, they can actually set it up. So it notifies them every time you give the student feedback as well. But if I click feedback here, um, this is where I can find the video feedback. And if I pull that up here, um, you would see the video pop up and the students can actually watch it. Um, I, I don't mind that it's easy to use, but it's really not positioned where the actual assignment is. So they can listen to it, um, but that's not always the best case. So let me go back to Chrome over here and we'll pull up a different assignment. And so this assignment the students did, or the student did, um, it has him evaluating his nutrition, you know, and I think it was a scale of one to three. And so if they did really well, they got a three. If they did poorly, it was zero or one. And so what I want to do is give them feedback. Um, and this is going to be in combination with uh, the annotation tool. So once they've uploaded it, you have some annotation tools that are up here, but let me show you um, a tool called Screencast-O-Matic. Uh, screencast um, so you can go to Screencast-O-Matic and it's a free screencasting tool um, where you can actually capture it. One of the great parts about this is once you cast it, you can either upload the video to your own computer and put it in there as a file for the students to see, or even better, you can actually put it into your account which is right here where you can see I'm logged into my account here. And if I go to content and my videos right here, you can see the recording is here and I can easily copy this link and then share that link in the feedback. And then the students just click on that and they'll actually watch it, but they're actually gonna watch the recording of me annotating on top of their assignment. So they get it in real time. Um, as well. So let's try this and make sure hopefully this will work properly with everything else running on my computer. Once you click launch free recorder, it asks you to download the application. I've already downloaded it. So now I can just open it. And I'm going to pop back to here. So hopefully this will open up. Right on top. While we're waiting on that, Greg, do you know if D2L tracks whether students have viewed that feedback when you record it using the D2L tool? I know it'll show you when students read your feedback, it will say feedback read and it'll give the time. But yeah, for the videos, that would that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure about that part of it. Um, that's a, that is a good question. We'd have to find that out. Um, check with Kate, maybe, or somebody to see if they, it captures that kind of information. Um, I think that at the end of the day, it's on the student's end of things. So it's there, it's available. I can see it, they can see it. And that's all, that's enough for me, I guess. Yep, exactly. So with this tool, 
Um, once we have this up, I'm going to go ahead and position everything. So this is going to record this grid area here. And you can see up at the top, it's the recording. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and hit record. And then it's going to count down three, two, one. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and click my annotate tool and possibly drawing tool. Um, get it set up the way you want before you start the recording. But what I could do is go ahead and start um, talking through each one of these, like the least cups, you know, fruit or talking about fruit or talking about vegetables. And I can annotate over top of this. Um, and then once I'm finished giving him the feedback and putting my annotations right on top of his assignment, then I'm going to come up here to pause and then I'm going to go ahead and switch this off and say done. Um, so we'll go ahead and hit done and then it's going to allow me to do a quick share. And so that's what I want to do is do a quick share so I can quickly move from one student to the next on doing these feedback. And so what it has to do, the link is copied now. It's already rendered. Actually, it's almost, it's going, you can see it says 30, 40%. So it just takes a minute to upload it onto their server. Once it's done, the link is ready. And then now what I can do is I can come here and paste the link here. Um, and then maybe give them, you know, this is your, this is your feedback for the assignment you know, or whatever, uh, I could spell. Um, anyway, and then go ahead and hit publish. And then that student would actually just click on the link and then pull up the video. Let's see if we can, here, we'll move this out of the way so we can see it. So then the video actually shows up here and the student can actually watch the video straight from there. So I, to me, it's a great way to be able to record um, some feedback while giving them the annotations, while being on the, it's about as close as you can get for having the assignment right there where the student's watching it and you're talking through it. Um, so that's a great way to do that. But all of these in here, and what I would probably recommend you do is go to details for each one and don't just have it called recording one recording two you probably want to actually um you know have the student's name and then whatever the assignment is or something like that so it makes it because if you got 15 or 20 students per class and you're doing this all the time you're going to have a whole lot of videos in here and it's going to be hard to find them um any questions on that Greg, I have a quick question. When you were moving from one student to the next and it was giving you that countdown, is that a countdown for you to move to that next student and start to kind of snip the screen where you're going to share and record and get your tools in place and then you can go to the next student and the next student and the next student? The or, countdown was to count down until I actually start doing the recording. And then there was, a, there was another countdown at the end, I think, when you stopped it. Oh, the rendering part. Yeah. Yes. It went, yeah. So what that's doing is it's taking that file and right. putting it on that website so you could share it out. And that takes a minute to do, depending on how long, how long the recording is. Okay. So if you have several minutes worth, it might take you a few minutes in order for it to go to the, you know, to render right. um, and then share the link out. So, so I'm thinking about for online students who you know, turn in an assignment that could really use some of that feedback and, you know, don't really have a lot of time in their schedule because they are working in full-time students. So maybe that handful of students, this would be really useful. Yeah, this is probably not something I'd do with every single assignment, right, right. all students, because this would be time consuming, but right. certain assignments or certain students' yes. assignments that really need that feedback Yes. Um, then this would absolutely be helpful, I think, to, to be able to do. Um, any other questions, comments? There's one in the chat. Uh, Vicki asks, isn't there a time limit 
for Screencast-O-Matic or a number of recordings that you can produce? Um, I've not found a number of recordings. 15 minutes is the, the length of, that you can do for one recording, but I've not seen anything in their pricing model that shows for the free version because um, it was another tool that I was going to show. And then once I looked at the pricing, I realized it was limited to 25 videos total for the free version. Um, or you could pay $8 a month for the, and that's a really good tool too, but you have to pay in order to get the unlimited video. I've not seen in this particular tool any limit for the amount of videos that you can produce. Um, I'll dig a little bit more because I had to switch from Loom to this one. Um, and so I'll dig a little bit more and find out that information to see if there is any. And then I can always share that with the rest of the group. Um, but I know Screencast-O-Matic for recording purposes, not necessarily uploading to their, um, their website, but just recording. The free version lets you do unlimited, however much, if you're going to just save it to your own computer. Um, so, Greg, could it be similar to like, you know, recording your screen in Zoom as you give detailed notes and feedback? You could. The one thing about Zoom that you would have to think about is you would have to start a different session for every single one that you would do your with your students because you would record it. It would render that link and that video and then you would share the link. So it would take quite a while to do those and then go back in and like share the link with your students. Whereas this kind of setup that you saw how quickly it was that it rendered the video, it automatically gave me the link, and then I was able to just pop it right into the feedback and be able to share it out with the students. And so mm -hmm. that's one of the advantages um, to doing it that way. Yeah. So Excellent. Thank you so much. You could, you could do it in Zoom as long as you start and stop the recording. It's going to give you a different file, but you would have no idea unless you did something like went alphabetically or had some kind of a you have a hard time figuring out which file went with which student so you, his idea of starting a new meeting every time would be useful but you could do it the other way too in zoom you would just have oh, to remember right. what order you went in with your students and then snipping each one you know well no it would just be a different file when you start and stop the recording if you pause it it's one file if you start and stop it it gives you multiple files mm -hmm. Oh, that okay. could work actually. Stopping, starting, stopping, yeah, stopping. it's like I said, you just have to remember which order you went in or open right. each file. Make sure you're sending the right student the right feedback. Okay. Yeah, I think if I were to do it that way, I forgot that you can do that, um, stopping and starting, and then just pull up all your recordings. So if you did like eight or 10 of them, then do all of them and then open up your recordings and then right. just go into each one. And I think you can edit the name of them. And mm -hmm. so once you end up pulling up each one, then say, okay, this one's Brandon and this one's Christina and this one's Candace or this one's Daniel or whatever, and go ahead and mark those. And then you can grab the link for each one of those and stick them into the feedback. So it'd be an extra stepper tool, but you know, you absolutely have unlimited, um, and you can use the annotation tool just like you use in mm -hmm. um, built into it. So yeah, that's definitely another a great way to, to use Zoom as well. The last one I wanted to show you all was in Flipgrid. Um, so this is a Flipgrid from my class where these students were posting about <clears throat> essential nutrients, I think. But one of the things that you can do as well um, is give feedback. But if you're giving feedback to the students, you may not necessarily want the other students to see what feedback you are. And so if you go down here to where it says public and change that to private <clears throat> and then hit the record tool, then you're giving them private feedback that only that student can see. And so the rest of the students that are a part of that topic can't see it. And so um, I've not used that this semester and actually didn't realize until I was putting this thing together that that was possible for doing the private uh, feedback uh, within there. And so that's another way to give video feedback, especially if it's specific to the student um, and possibly constructive and you don't want necessarily the other students to hear it. You can do it right directly into the Flipgrid. Here's a quick testimony about how 
Flipgrid is useful anywhere. If you look at the student on the right, looks like he's given his feedback somewhere on the out or his initial post, whatever that is. He's outside somewhere, maybe at a sporting event or something. So yep. it's helpful. Yep. <laughs> he's a tra- he's one of the track athletes. So I was I, gonna say, yeah, I was like, hey, you're at a track meet there, buddy. <laughs> sitting on the sideline waiting for his next event and realizing that he needed to get his assignment in probably so he pulled out his phone and <laughs> and did it most of them are usually sitting in their dorm room or in their in their at their house right uh, doing it so awesome all right well thank you greg i appreciate it you hit all of the strengths and weaknesses that i had on those slides not there you go. That was, yeah, so that was uh, that was great. I don't even need to pull those back up. I mean, you just have to be cautious about how time consuming some of the video feedback things can be. So I would not suggest trying to tackle all of your students in one class or definitely not all of your classes at once. Be selective with how you do that. And uh, it, it's a really useful tool. So hope, hope you guys will take a give it a try, take advantage of it. That's all from me and from us. Does anybody have any questions, comments, or anything we can uh, help with before we wrap up? Thank you. I'm running. I have another meeting at one, but I appreciate all of your time and effort and, and look forward to seeing the recording of these tools, the of this session for the tools. Absolutely. The rest of the slides will be posted on our webinars website as well. So if you're really curious what I had to say about the video feedback, Greg covered it all anyway, but the visuals will be there for you to look at as well. So I just wanted to say thank you. It's Danae. Thank you so much. Thanks, Danae. This is Sister Roberta. I'm really pleased that I connect for this uh, webinar. Uh, also, you had a quote right at the beginning. You could have put one from Maria Montessori also. She definitely- Which one is that? Any one of hers. Talks Any one of hers. <laughs> about self-learners. Absolutely. Well, we'll go ahead and stop the recording and